Okay, we're live on YouTube. Well, that's show 130, you wanna start? Yeah, Pat, let me just go live here on Zoom and then we are ready to go. All right. Okay, Pat, the floor is yours. All right, well, I wanna welcome everybody to the July 15th board meeting. It says regular meeting, I guess it's not really regular, but we're doing audio and video via Zoom. Well, I wanna thank everybody for joining today. Um, so we're gonna call the meeting to order at this time and um, we'll go to agenda item two, which is approved previous airport board meetings meeting minutes. Anybody have a- Oh, oh can you, um, can you first start out uh, declaring that a quorum is present? Sure. We do have a quorum. We have several people, so we, we do have a quorum. A quorum is present. Okay. Hey, Robert, we'll see you now. All right, everybody approved the, the previous board meeting minutes. And I had a chance to read them. I just have a question from my, on my part on the previous minutes. Go ahead. Uh, last time, uh, part 139 inspection had not been done. Any results of that part 139 inspection? I've got Sean right here. He's been working that out with the FAA. Oh, Sean. 139 update inspection. Sure. So our part 139 inspection uh, was rescheduled tentatively for the middle of August. Uh, we've been told by our certification safety inspector uh, that with the current conditions with COVID-19, that may have to be delayed even further. Uh, we're still waiting for more guidance from the FA on that. Um, but once we uh, get more of an update, we'll be uh, glad to let everyone know. Thank you. No problem. Any more, any more questions about the previous minutes? I'll make the motion that we approve them. I second that. I, second. I think I heard a second from somebody. Yeah. The meeting, the minutes have been approved. All right, I believe we don't have any public comments by email according to Jeremy. So we'll go on to the acceptance of the airport master plan. Okay, uh, thank you, Pat. So as you guys know, we've been working on this master plan for some time now. We finally got all the drafts completed. Um, we got the buy-offs, most of the buy-offs from the FAA. We're just waiting for that final buy-off from the FAA, but they like to see the city support before it actually goes to the FAA. So we've invited Molly to come on. Uh, the majority of the board members here have sat through most of her meetings and know what she's going to talk about, but she's going to just do a quick summary of the master plan and, and what we, were, we will be looking for at the end of her uh, presentation as a recommendation to take the city council to accept the master plan as drafted. So Molly? please. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So I have to look at my ugly mug the whole time. I've got a, uh, there it is. I've got a quick presentation to give. Please feel free to ask any questions um, as I'm going along. I'm going to move relatively quickly because as Jeremy said, a lot of you have been involved throughout this. So um, we'll get started. Let me get all my windows situated. You'd think we'd be a master of these Zoom meetings by now. All right. So just to start off, what is an airport master plan? It's a 12 to 24 month planning process undertaken to essentially put together the vision for your airport for the next 20 years. Um, it is prepared in accordance with standards that are released by the FAA as well as industry, uh, the aviation industry. It results in a phased development plan as well as what's called a CIP, a capital improvement program. What that does is it allows the FAA and the city of San Angelo to make plans for future development needs at the airport. Um, it identifies projects eligible for federal airport funding assistance. We always try to get that 90% of the bill paid for by the FAA. Um, having a strong master plan with updated forecast, updated inventory, and an updated airport layout plan helps you be a little bit more competitive when you're applying for those, that federal funding. One thing that I wanna mention before we get very far is I'm gonna talk about the airport forecast. And this master plan is really a forecast driven master plan. That's how most master plans are. 
St. Anne's was a little bit unique in that if you look at just the forecast, you've got the facilities that are needed to accommodate your current users. So this master plan is not as much forecast operational driven as it is user demand driven. So it's something to keep in mind as we're visiting today. There's essentially four key milestones in the master planning process inventory in those aviation forecasts, facility requirements, those things that are needed to meet the forecast levels. We then develop project alternatives, a recommended development concept, and then you put together what's called the airport layout plan. Now the FAA approves two parts of this master planning process. They approve the aviation forecast, which they did earlier this year, and they also approve that airport layout plan. So we checked one box with the forecast once the airport board and the city council um, adopts the airport, the airport layout plan, we'll send that off to the FAA for their approval. So quickly, why did the city choose to spend the funds and the energy and the effort to update the, the previous master plan that was done in 1994? It's essentially because the FAA requested it. I've been in front of you guys in the past. We talked about the, the, the closure of runway 927 because the FAA only had funding support for three runways. That combined with the age of your master plan and the need for a thorough ALP update resulted in the FAA requesting a master plan be done. Um, why else did you guys update your master plan? It's because Jeremy and the airport get regular inquiries regarding hangars. There are folks that want to build at your airport and there's not a lot of developable space. So it was important that this plan be done to identify future development areas um, so you don't put a hangar in the wrong place. It gets expensive to move those facilities once they're constructed. Real quickly, we did do quite a bit of stakeholder outreach um, during this process. We had four planning advisory and technical advisory committee meetings, and we also had three public meetings. All of these were well attended. I was very impressed with the city's commitment to this project. Normally, as these master plans go on, you lose a little bit of interest, but that wasn't the case here. We had really good involvement all the way through. So let's hop into the recommendations and please if you have any questions or you want more details you you let me know and I'll stop. Um, forecasts were essentially broken into two parts. We have the commercial service forecast and we have the general aviation forecast. Um, we had a, a partner, Lonerman Brown, that did the commercial service forecasting. They pulled in their air service development folks so we could really get a good idea. San Angelo was, you're unique. Um, you're running very high load factors. Your employments have been good, and please keep in mind everything that I say is pre-COVID. COVID has, of course, impacted everything. Um, but in a nutshell, what we found was what was going to limit your commercial service growth wasn't necessarily your terminal or your passengers. It was the number of airlines. American Airlines flies to one location. And so when you look at them running their planes back and forth to DFW, we figured they were possibly going to max out at about 76,000 employments in 2037 in 2,500 aircraft. That's down from what we were forecasting in 2022, simply because they're phasing out those smaller jets and bringing in those larger regional jets. So we just, let's do another scenario. Let's see what would happen if another airline was introduced to the airport. Um, so we ran forecasts, we had more than one market serve, whether it was a Denver, a Houston, another market at DFW, if that would attract some folks that are currently driving. And that took our forecast numbers up to 101,192, and that's employments. And again, from it about doubled, well, it didn't quite double your operations, but it upped your operations from the 2,500 to the 4,380 operations. The reason we did this is because your previous airport layout plan called for the construction of a new terminal in the areas between your two runways, that V shape. And we wanted to see if we maxed out the possible employments at San Angelo, do we still need to set aside that space for a terminal? So that's why we looked into these two scenarios of a best case scenario with, with two airlines or continuing off American. And what we found is, is that with some slight modifications, I think we were adding about 2,000 square feet, your current terminal would be able to accommodate two airlines at employments over 100,000. So that's really why we got into the weeds on the commercial employments. From a general aviation activity standpoint, this is always a wild card. It depends on flight training. It depends on fuel prices. Um, the reason we did it really focused on the general aviation forecast was because of the increase in business jet usage we've seen at the airport. It's increased pretty rapidly over the past few years. 
um, not just because of oil and gas, ASU brings planes in activities and financial that bring folks in. So really we saw an increase in the business jet usage. The single engine, the training operations that's really dependent on the military and it's dependent on the flight training at the airport. Any questions on the forecasts? Okay, we'll move on to the facility requirements. What we did is we took the airfield for or the airport forecast and we ran different models to decide what kind of facilities you need to accommodate those forecasts. So as I mentioned, from a commercial service standpoint, we found that we could expand your existing terminal to meet that commercial service demand. Um, we found there was a need for additional aircraft storage hangars, especially for those larger aircraft. We also identified potential revenue enhancing opportunities for the airport. But the biggest thing that we found in the facility requirements was there was a need for airfield improvements to meet runway, um, to meet FAA's runway and taxiway design standards, specifically as they relate to things like um, where your taxiways are located, runway safety area, those types of things. So we then went in and we did our alternatives analysis and we ended up with this recommended development concept. This recommended development concept, the runway and taxiway improvements that you see, those are necessary to meet the FAA design standards um, as they've as currently published. You see a whole bunch of new hangers. The reason that we did this hangar layout is because as I said earlier, you have limited developable space at the airport. And what we hate to see is we hate to see airports come in and put a hangar in a place that limits access to their side of the airport. So for example, on your last airport layout plan, and I hope you can see my little mouse moving across the apron, this taxi lane was back, um, there's a, I'm sorry, it's right here. There's a taxi lane put back here that provided access for additional hangar development at the back of the airport. What we found was allowing that to be your only access point was really gonna create a choke point situation where you had folks waiting to get in and out of there and it was gonna restrict the size of aircraft that could get back there. So things that we looked at as far as hangar layout included, okay, do we need a second way to get back to this back side of the airport? Because again, your current developable space is a little bit limited. We'll walk through that now. What you see on the image now is essentially the zero to five year plan, the short-term development. And what this is, is we have closed runway 927. We've converted that to a taxiway. We're showing expanded apron in this area. You've got a great FA program manager that, that likes apron projects. And then we essentially filled in the gaps. So these orange boxes that you see are locations where you could put hangers. Now, if somebody came to the airport today and said, I wanna build a hangar, you essentially have one, two, three, four, five places they could build a hangar without significant infrastructure improvements. In order to develop this hangar complex, you're gonna to have to relocate some T hangers. In order to develop this area, you're gonna need a taxi lane and an apron. Um, and then hopping down here, this is where the current GTE facility is. That would need to be demolished to construct for these. So when I was talking about limited developable space, you really have four areas where you could build a hangar today. Um, so we wanted to make sure that as we were laying out our CIP for the airport, we didn't put hangers in places where we needed access in the future. Um, what we have back here, this is an expansion of the apron as I mentioned. What we have back here is access to the current paint hangers that Ranger uses to paint aircraft. They're in this area right here. When we did the land use management strategy study for the airport, we found that there's a desire for folks to increase the, um, the maintenance facilities at the airport. Um, currently, you've got poor boys, it's tucked back, you've got kind of maintenance, you've got a little mini MRO on your airport. What we're showing here is, is that if Ranger wanted to move their maintenance facilities and build a hangar for those, this would be a great place to put that. You've got great access to Knickerbock Road for employees, and of course, you've got good access to the paint hangers that you're using. So that's really what this is designed for. This is designed for more of the folks that do the aircraft maintenance. So that's the short term, any questions? Okay, let's go on to the intermediate term. The things that you see in gray are- right, Molly, Teresa, did you have a question? No. Okay, sorry. Couldn't tell if your hand was up or not. You're good. 
Um, moving on, so this is the intermediate. This is the five to 10 year uh, planning horizon. Anything that you see in this dark gray are things that we, that were in the short term. So we're assuming that those are existing because for example, you can't build these two hangers in this apron unless these hangers are there too. So we're building upon the previous plan. You'll see the hanger development isn't as prevalent in their intermediate term as it was previously. What we're starting to focus on are the runway and the taxiway improvements that are needed to meet FA design standards. Currently, you've got a displaced landing threshold and you've got declared distances on runway 1836. So what we're doing as part of this project is we're shifting this runway in to eliminate the need for declared distances and we're providing a full runway safety area before Knickerbocker Road. So then of course we need a couple new connector taxiways and we're replacing the pavement that was lost, so to speak, at this end of the runway. Um, and then of course the you have not here. Way. Another thing of note is, is your current intersection of runway 321 and 1836 right in this area. This does not meet FA design standards. They wanted us to look at decoupling these runway ends because essentially to get to the runway three end, you have to taxi across a runway at a high energy portion, which is not encouraged. So they consider this to not necessarily be the safest of alignments for runways. So we push the runway three to one end back to this point. The other thing in the intermediate term that, that we found when we did the analysis is during instrument weather conditions, runway 1836 actually has better wind coverage. So we looked at relocating the, the Mauser, the light lane and the instrument approaches to the runway, to runway 1836 instead of runway 321. This provides the benefit of not just having the better weather runway, have your, your better approaches, but also the runway that's closer to your land site facilities. So as runway 321 is extended, the instrument landing system will be picked up and essentially it'll be re relocated down here with new facilities. They won't use the old ones more than likely. So again, this intermediate term, these runway and taxiway improvements are really to meet FA design standards um, for your runway intersections, getting rid of some taxiways that are not in good location and correcting that runway safety area. This area over here, we're gonna call it A7. Let me think, I've been working on projects at the San Angelo Airport for about eight years. And there have probably been three or four occasions where we've gotten phone calls and the question has been, there's an MRO that works on 737s that may wanna to come to San Angelo. You guys have great weather for that. The question's always been where they come. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to create an area over in this part of the airport that could accommodate a large school, um, a, an MRO facility, aircraft manufacturing. We've got all kinds of new aircraft, manned, unmanned, LNG, electric, all kinds of new aircraft are being developed. And believe it or not, just like Elon Musk, all those guys want to put their, their manufacturing facilities in Texas. So we wanted to make sure we had a nice large area over here where something like that could develop. Now, previously, I talked a little bit about commercial service. In your previous planning efforts, this area was the area that was set aside for a new commercial service terminal. When we did those forecasts and we found that your current terminal can accommodate your future demand, that allowed us to reevaluate this part of the airport. So that's the intermediate. I think I, I hit on about everything. We did show some additional hangar development. Um, one thing that I didn't mention that I probably need to mention is when you look at your airport, currently you've got governmental uses down at this end and you've got general aviation down at this end. What we wanted to do is we wanted to solidify that a little bit. So you're going to see that we've got the, the smaller, the private, the single engine, the small twins, all planned hangars down in this area. And they get larger to the business jets. And then we come down here. This is kind of the business industrial governmental side of the airport. So we're not co-locating those users. Now I'll hop into the long-term development. Um, the long-term development, again, this is the out years. This is when you look at a master plan, this is the part that's the most, I hate to use gray because we've got gray on this exhibit. But the long, the purpose of the long-term is simply for preservation. It's to make sure that you have the space planned in case you need it in the future. 
So I'm going to walk you through real quick what you see here. I'm going to start at the, at the end of runway 1836. You'll see you've got another small extension. Now we've got a shift. That is to pull the runway protection zone off of Knickerbocker Road. Currently part of that runway protection zone overlaps Knickerbocker. The FAA prefers that there be nothing within the runway protection zone. So there's another shift. If I was a betting lady, which unfortunately I am sometimes, I don't know that that project would ever be funded by the FAA from a priority standpoint. But to meet standards, we need to show it on the AFP. So what we've got is we've got this runway shift, extension of the parallel taxiway, some new connector taxiways to this area. Let's hop up here and talk about runway 321. You'll see that we've extended taxiway hotel down to about the midpoint. And then we've got this taxiway on the other side of the runway that's really going off to nowhere. That's because we didn't want to be short-sighted. We told you that you likely aren't going to need a new terminal, but the city's looking at possibly the interstate coming through. You've got a rail park that's going in. You've got a bunch of things happening in the city of San Angelo that really could change the face of the community. So we wanted to make sure that we set aside land, should our forecast be incorrect, which they often are, um, just because it's the nature of the beast. We wanted to make sure we set aside some land for commercial service. So this purple area up here is land that we're showing could be acquired and you could build a commercial service terminal over here as well as cargo facilities. So we wanted to make sure that we showed this over here and why did we put it on the side of the runway? It's because when you look at the future interstate plans, the interstate's over on the side of the city. So this would allow for you to connect a road to the interstate to provide access to commercial service. That would really provide a great benefit because as you go to Lubbock, Midland, some of these other areas, the commercial service folks are separated from the rest of the airport users. And if you can get the commercial service folks kind of put over on one side of the airport, it makes things sim uh, simpler for folks that want to operate on the entire apron and things like that. And you're not working around those secured areas for commercial service. So we really wanted to segregate them over here. Um, that's why we would need this parallel taxiway would be to provide access to the commercial service terminal building. Hopping down over on the other side of the airport, we did show some expansions to the terminal. Um, we showed an additional gate being added and some square footage added over by baggage claim. So you could expand the baggage claim area, especially if you get two airlines. We showed the continuation of the construction of some smaller hangars for smaller aircraft, additional T hangars. And then we got this whole big area back here. Um, we would close Hangar Road and develop this as an apron. The hangars that we have on here, this would be aircraft storage. All of these down here, these would be just general aviation users. We wouldn't, wouldn't think we'd have the businesses and industry because we want them on the other side of the airport. So big long hangar. The area at the very end above C1, this is where you would see the cargo. Um, currently, FedEx is located right here. You've got good access to Knickerbocker, good access to the rest of the city. Let's say UPS decides they don't want to unload their packages on your apron anymore and they want to build a facility. This would be a great place for them to go so we can have those folks co-located. So this, again, this is more preservation. This is so that you don't let somebody build a convenience store or additional baseball fields in this area. This is preservation because you don't have a lot of space to build hangars as I communicated previously. Coming back over here on the business industrial side, again, this is what we are gonna consider an air park. There are folks that have small airport business, small businesses at, air, at airports. They could be located over in this area. Um, we found that there really isn't demand for a big business or industrial park at the airport. So continuing the aviation use in this area would be ideal. So that's the story of the long-term development. Any questions on how this is laid out or any of the thought process behind it? We have a question with the displacement or the relocation of 1836. Mm -hmm. Apparently you increase a clear zone for an ILS. What's the latest on the ILS? We have not, the FA, um, this was a question that came up on our last planning advisory committee meeting. We have not been able to get much feedback from the FA. Everyone's working remotely. So we're still checking into that. That will be a question that we're gonna ask. They're gonna look in, in detail at that ILS and the clearances when they review the ALP. So that's really gonna be the trigger for them to make themselves available to answer our questions. Uh, 
Ali, I have a question. Uh, has this master plan been approved by the FAA yet, or is that, uh, is that done later on? No, that'll be the next step. As Jeremy indicated previously, what we need is we need to have the city accept this master plan and accept the airport layout plan. Once the city does that, it allows Jeremy to sign, put his signature on the ALP set. We then submit it along with a checklist to the FAA, and that's when they'll start their review and approval process. They will be approving that ALP set, but they will not be approving the master plan. Okay. And Jeremy, are you completely comfortable with this plan? I am. Yeah, we've reviewed it several times and we're, we're finishing up the airport layout plan, which is the most important part, but we'll make it bulletproof so we can get as much funding as possible when we do present it to the FAA. So yes, I'm comfortable with the plan. Okay, so no concerns of a major or medium level that you would like addressed before this goes to council and forwarded to FAA? No, I think Centurion did a really good job at, at planning for all users. We've got the small GA users, medium GA business, cargo, commercial. I mean, we, we've gone to the extreme, to, at, like, a, like you said, a 737 overhaul facility. So I think we've put our airport in the best position we possibly can. And, and if we can get the FAA to buy off on it when funding does become available, we're, we're ready to go. So yeah, I, I think... And are you in general comfortable with expansion to existing terminal if we could ever get another carrier in and no need for a new terminal in the reasonably distant future? Uh, yeah, and I think that's all just obviously driven by funding. Um, if we are able to get another airline in, this, this building was mostly designed for another airline. So we could do right. some minor, minor improvements here on this facility to keep it operational and sustainable for two airlines. Um, but long term, I think it's good to reserve that land on the other side of the airport. When the freeway does come in, um, we just hate to give that to a small user and, and restrict usage. It would be nice to keep commercial air yeah. aviation on one side, GA on the other, but but it's just going to depend on funding. Okay, thank you. Jeremy, uh, this building handled two airlines long before we redid it. So it was like you said, it was redone to accommodate two airlines. Yeah, Fred, and thank you for that. I have talked to some other airlines and they've sent some of their real estate executives through the airport just to look at it. Um, and every single one of them has been very impressed with the building. We feel like there's some deficiencies here from two airline aspects. They say all the other airports they've been at, small regionals like us doesn't have the infrastructure we do. So we're, we're actually in good shape for a second airline. A third one's gonna get a little tough, but but when they're ready to come, we'll be ready for them. Good. Yeah, well, let's get the second one back before we work on the third one. <laughs> right. Uh, Jeremy, I, was, I wanted to ask also, with COVID, long range of, uh, the long range effects of COVID, is that gonna slow uh, federal funding, do you think, or do you know, have any idea? That's the billion dollar question right yeah. now. It, it has not slowed funding at all. In fact, it's increased funding a little bit okay. um, through the through the CARES Act. And I think it's this, this next package they want to propose. It's obviously an election year, but they're looking at infrastructure. Okay. And they're, they're the number that they've thrown for airport infrastructure is in the six billion dollar range. And so I think it's going to I think it's going to improve. And the, the timing of our master plan is perfect. If we can get this front of the FAA right now and say, look, you just got six billion dollars. We've got some money to spend, help us out. So I think it, we're pretty optimistic that the federal funding is gonna flow more so post COVID. Um, don't know what's gonna happen with the PFC. We've talked about the PFC gap, passenger facility charge. Um, it's capped at 450. We've proposed to Congress several times to raise it to nine and it keeps getting shot down. So if that thing doesn't increase then the federal government's gonna have to help and continue to give us more infrastructure dollars so we can continue to build and improve on what they've already given us. Good. Jeremy, do you know how long it's been capped at 450? That was the, and Molly helped me out, but I think that was the original amount in the year 2000. I did too, okay. That's what about what I thought, about 20 years. All right, Molly, you have anything more? Oh yes, Pat, we're only halfway done. Okay, well, go ahead. All this now. Um, 
Just to recap, as Jeremy indicated, you guys have got some very competitive projects with FA money. So anything that's a runway, taxiway, knock on wood, apron connected, it's our hope that this master plan has you guys are really well positioned for those types of funds. Um, <clears throat> again, the runway improvements are safety and that always competes, that, that does really well at the airport. <clears throat> so that leaves the, the hangers, the aprons and just the other general things that need to be done at the airport. So we're gonna hop into the finances now. Um, right now you've got federal obligations, as you guys know, when you accept money from the, the FAA, you've got to keep any money earned at the airport on the airport. Um, you've got grant assurances. You've got a number of funding sources available to you, FAA IP grants, next dot ramp grants, which aren't very big. They're um, up to $100,000 with a 50% match. And then the other thing is, is looking at private other governmental investment, Customs and Border Protection is putting money out at the airport. Um, then you've got local funds. So let's hop in here and let's get into the weeds a little bit on your potential CIP funding sources. What we did is we did a detailed CIP, uh, the engineers in the office put together numbers with today's dollars, how much it would cost to build everything that's listed on that, old, that recommended development concept. I have to take that back, everything but the hangers. The hangers themselves are not included. But when you look at the apron, runways, taxes, everything that's needed to accommodate those hangers, you're looking at about $256 million. Of that, we believe $134 million could compete for federal dollars. The rest of it would come from possibly text up through those ramp grants, the third party investment, and then the local dollars. Now, when we say local dollars, these include the PFCs that you already use to match grants. Currently, and Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, but the FA funds 90%, and then I believe it's your PFCs that help them at other 10%. So as far as reliance on the city's general fund, historically, that's not been the case. Existing airport revenue sources include the airlines. You've got terminal leases, as we already talked, you've got PFCs, restaurant concession revenue, rental car revenue, building and ground leases. Then you've got fuel flowage, landing fees, everything these guys do to get those charters off to, uh, to go to boot gambling. They get, they get funds for that in aircraft storage. What we wanted to do and what we promised everybody we would do when we started this master plan is we would look at potential new airport revenue sources. So the most simplest of this when you do a master plan is, hey, I, I provided a bunch of new hangar locations for you. That's the easy one. That's your new hangar and your ground leases. We also looked at auto parking. If the airport was to charge for parking, what kind of revenues could be collected? Currently, you're not collecting for parking charges. Hold on, I'm gonna get to this in just a couple of seconds because the same goes with rental car customer facility charges. Um, currently, the city does not collect what are called CFCs. Now, what a CFC is, is just like a passenger facility charge. It's something that is put on the bill to the renter, and the renter pays it. So if the city chooses a $3 a day CFC, the rental car companies do not pay that. It's passed on to the people that are renting the car at the airport. Other things we looked at for potential airport revenue sources would be shared facilities, whether it's a consolidated fuel farm, a GA, there was an interest in some general aviation self-serve facilities, or a consolidated quick turnaround facility with those rental cars. You, currently you have two where they go and they vacuum and they clean the rental car for the next use. So let's look at the parking revenue and I'll get as far into the weeds as you want to on this. What we looked at is, is if you decided to start charging $5 a day at the airport, based on your number of emplaned passengers, our assumption that 25% of those folks would park their car at the airport, resulting in 15,623 parking transactions. Assuming those folks stay three days, at $5 a day, we're looking at an increase in revenue of about $234,000. We then forecasted out to 2037. We did not look at bringing the second airline in. We did top the 76,000 operations um, just because we wanted to give kind of a conservative estimate. And we found that it goes from 234,000 to $285,510. Now there is a cost associated with maintaining a facility such as that. Um, but what we found is that the total parking revenue of $5 a day with all these assumptions would be a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Molly. Yes. You, uh, now the $5 a day you have projected all the way through 2037, that's a long time. I mean, the fee would probably go up. Yes. Okay, yeah. 
Well, and this is something, you know, there's, and Jeremy and Sean are tired of hearing me talk about Manhattan, Texas, or Manhattan, Kansas. Manhattan is very similar to San Angelo in that it's a similar sized community. It's got a university and it's got a military presence. And Manhattan is similar to San Angelo. They've never charged for parking. And so they've been going around and around and around for the past three years on whether or not they should charge for parking. Um, so really in talking to Jesse Rommel, who's the airport manager there, he said, you wanna be conservative with your forecast. But he said what they're recognizing in Manhattan is once they start charging for parking, people's expectations are gonna go up. So they're gonna say the parking in Abilene's covered and I'm paying here, why is my parking not covered? So then you might end up covering part of the lot. Well, the part of the lot you cover, you might take that up to $7 a day to recoup some of those monies. And so once you start charging for parking, there's all kinds of different scenarios that can occur but you're right, it's not likely going to stay at $5 a day through 2037. Okay, yeah. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions on that? Okay, so let's go to the next one. This is that potential CFC revenue. And again, this is a, a fee, so to speak, that is tacked onto the rental car, paid for by the user. So when I fly into San Angelo and rent a car, I'd be paying $3 per rental car day over what I would be paying otherwise. Um, this is not uncommon. Abilene's got CFCs, Midland, Odessa, Lubbock. It's not uncommon to collect CFCs. Um, so what we did is we ran some numbers. At $3 per rental car day, similar Looking at your deplane passengers, your rental car transaction, average length of stay, we found the CFC revenue started at 140,000 in 2021, and by 2037 it could be an increase of 171,000. Now you don't have the level of capital cost to implement CFCs because there's not, you know, a physical gate or collecting money from folks, but there are some strings tied with CFCs, and then you have to spend those funds on resources at the airport that those rental cars use. So these monies would go towards um, the parking lot that the rental cars are parked at. They would go towards that consolidated QTA facility we'll talk about in a minute. But essentially CFC funds need to go to spaces where those folks that rent cars are using. Any questions on CFCs? And this, all, all CFCs requires an ordinance in front of the city council, you can start collecting. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go back to the CFCs real quick because I realized that there was a slide after this that I wanted that I didn't have. One thing that we talked about um, was this consolidated rental car facility or a QTA facility, a quick turnaround. What those are, they're facilities that are built by the airports where the rental cars lease space or they pay per use. And it's essentially a car wash, a vacuum, there's possibly fuel, but it's all consolidated in one area. What that would do at St. Angelo's, it would free up some space because currently you've got two of these facilities out in front of the airport. There's really no design standards or upkeep requirement for them. Um, so should you decide to charge CFCs and maybe use that money for a QTA, what you can then do is you can charge the rental car companies for the use. Um, Tyler Pounds Regional Airport did this all oh, about five years ago. They've got a beautiful QTA facility that actually kind of matches their terminal. They charge the rental car companies $3 a wash. They charge them a certain amount to, uh, to rent a closet space to keep all of their supplies. And I believe they're talking about adding fuel out there. So they're going to get a fuel flow HV2 instead of the rental car companies taking those vehicles to gas stations. Um, so a QTA facility is another revenue source. It's really hard to put the numbers to because it depends on how nice of a facility that you construct. Um, but when it comes to new revenue sources, those QTAs can eventually turn around into sources of revenue that can help to, to keep the airport up at the same time. So after all of that, we did the airport master plan analysis. We did alternatives, we did our recommended development concept, we put together a CIP to tell you how much it was going to cost. We looked at some new revenue sources, and so our next steps are, sorry, my other monitor is behind my laptop, to give a presentation similar to this, but probably briefer, to the city council so that they can um, 
go ahead and let Jeremy send that ALP back to the FAA. We will then send the ALP to the FAA for review, comment, and approval. Now, I will caution you, there are times that the FAA comes back and their comments do result in changes to the ALP. It might be a runway length, it might be a taxiway location. We don't go back and update the entire master plan if something like that happens. We will update the recommended development concept in the CIP. Um, but we really don't anticipate, because again, the projects we've got on that ALP, they're safety projects, and they're also land use planning for the future. Jeremy, did I leave anything out? Uh, just the other 200 pages. <laughs> We are working today on getting Jeremy PDFs of every chapter, the appendices in that draft AOP. Um, and Jeremy, I believe you're going to put that up on the airport website if I'm not speaking for you. Um, but that should be up soon and then you can read all of the, the other 200 pages. It's, it's good. It's interesting information. You guys, really, you've got a unique airport. You're in a very unique part of the country. You've got tremendous opportunities. Um, it's exciting to... Uh, to not only have a company in San Angelo, but to see what the, the potential of this airport is. So it's exciting times to be in aviation. Can you, can you hear me? This is Bobby Frank. And yeah, I just we can wanted hear. to, if, if I could, I just wanted to add a little comment. Um, and I know, I know the airport needs to show revenue, but I'll give you an example my personal example of going in and out of Dallas Love Field, which I did for a long time, the fees, and I know you're not talking about affecting a lot of general aviation, but to just give you an idea, the fees at that airport got to be so high that I now land at Fort Worth and drive to Dallas because I can overnight my airplane in a hangar for $30 a night versus $200 a night. Fuel's about $5 a gallon versus over eight. Uh, I, these fees, I'm just concerned that at some point, and I know you're not referring to general aviation here, but, but the airline passengers, um, it just, it gets to where you just don't want to deal with it at convention I went to 30 years ago in, in Houston. By the time I paid the fees on the room at the hotel, at the airport, the next year I went to that meeting, I turned around and went back home. Same day. Not going to spend the night, not going to pay those fees. So I'm just... That's my two cents. Not that it makes any difference, but there's, there's still a lot of people out there that worry about what things cost. So. Well, I think, I think what uh, Centurion Planning Design has showed us that the fees aren't that terrible. And like you said, it's mostly for the airlines versus general aviation. I agree with you, Bobby. You know, Love Field is his redness going in there. Uh, usually going to uh, the small airports, uh, Arlington or, uh, or and, and take a courtesy car to DFW. It works a lot better. You know. Anyway, yeah, well, I do agree with what you're saying. But anyway, I think I think what we've got here is a is a great plan. And and uh, before we put in uh, approval to uh, our motion to approve this to send it to council, I want to take this time to thank Centurion Planning and Development that they did an excellent job at this, and um, their professionalism is. You can see it very well in what they've done. And um, I just want to thank them and, uh, and tell them that they did a great job as far as I'm concerned. All right, Molly, do we need? Uh, can I just, I just want to throw one thing in there um, kind of for Jeremy and this is, I, I totally understand the fees and the charging and all of those things. Um, I fly general aviation and I fly commercial service. And of course I'm a small business owner. One thing that I want to, uh, Teresa mentioned that PFCs haven't gone up in 20 years. And the other thing that hasn't gone up is the AIP funds. So there's been $3.125 billion 
in the AIP program since I started my career. And while I say I'm 38, I'm not 38. Um, when I started in airport planning, you could get you could get taxi lane projects funded. You could get aprons funded. There was a lot of money that was going around to airports. That amount has not gone up in 16 or 17 years. And so the FA has the same amount of money and things haven't gotten any less expensive. The reason I'm saying this is because it's a very, it's a very competitive market to where there's a lot of people that need to have their runways worked on. And one of the questions the FA started asking about four years ago in this region is what are you doing to take care of yourself? What are you doing to generate money before you come and ask for us? So for example, Santa Fe Airport, they didn't collect PFCs and their employment levels are more than San Angelo's, but they weren't collecting PFCs. And the FA said, you need to be collecting PFCs. We're not going to pay all the bills. So they implemented a PFC program. The, Air, the FA really likes to see you maximize any revenue sources that you have before you come to them for the 10, 15, 20 million dollars. Um, so the, the conversations in the past with the FA, they've been along the lines of charging for parking. And because what that would do is it would take the parking lot and the roads out of their responsibility and I'll put it more, you'd be generating funds to do that yourself. So we're very sensitive to the fees. Um, the ones that, that we've mentioned in here, the charging for parking and the, especially the CFCs, those are things that are really, they become industry standard. So it's uncommon to run into an airport that isn't collecting CFCs. Um, there are some airports that are up at $9. Three dollars seemed like it was probably the right level for the airport. So I just wanted to, to let you know that the fees, toll roads especially, they get to be a lot. Um, the ones that we recommend in the master plan are relatively conservative. But I just want to throw that out there um, for you know for Jeremy the airport's behalf that this is a question the FAA asks too: is are you maximizing all of your revenue sources? So I get it though. It's it's tough when you increase the cost of your trip by 20% to cover the incidental stuff you didn't even know you were gonna get till you got home. Um, so I'll end with that. I got a question. On the midterm and long-term, did you include income from fuel flowage fees at all? Yes, that's included up in the, the, yes. What we did is we took what you currently make with all those, there's a whole financial part of the chapter that you can read. And we aggregated it out into the future based on number of operations and number of employments. And so when we looked at the money that was needed, that was all accounted for in the future revenue collections. And there's a pretty detailed write-up in the master plan on that. The things that weren't included were the things that you're currently not collecting. The CFCs, the um, parking, anything that would be a new source of revenue was not included in those forecasts. All right. Let just, go ahead. So let me make a quick comment on the fees. And we talked about this in the last meeting and you can see it in the minutes. Um, in fact, I'll give you an update on those fees that, that you approved in our last meeting later. Um, but what we do know is our cost per employment in San Angelo is a dollar and 16 cents. That's basically what it costs the airline to fly a passenger out of San Angelo. That is the third cheapest airport in the entire nation. So. The, the fees that we're proposing is gonna go back on the user. We don't like that the general aviation side of our airport has to subsidize the commercial side. That's not a user-based fee. Um, and so these fees would help us get back to user base. Then we would not have to raise GA fees. We can keep them where they're at, keep fuel flowage where they're at. We just, we feel like we need the, the commercial side of the airport um, to pay. And then that's why you approved the $3 parking last meeting. Um, that's not going to go through this year because of COVID-19. City Council's not hearing any fees at this moment, um, but I'll give you an update on that later. So we had asked Molly to help us be as self-sustaining as possible. We don't want to gouge anyone. We want to just be strictly user-based. What we make, we put back into the airport. All right, any more questions about the master plan? Well, um, I might say one more thing, Pat, if I could. I just, I wasn't attacking Molly. I was just, I just, you got to be careful with these things because uh, they, they can get out of hand, especially if they make money. That's all I got to say. Yeah, it's, it's understandable. You know, you're, you got a good point there. All right. Um, 
Can I have a motion to accept the airport master plan presented to the uh, city council? I make a motion. Make that motion. Accept that plan. A second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion's been passed. All right. Um, agenda five, airport leaf letting and de demonstration policy. Jeremy? Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, this is something that Sean and I have been working on long before all the protesting really started with the current situation. Um, but there's just been, there's been issues that have came up around airports where protesting has happened at airports and it's really shut down the entire operation of the airport. Um, Sean and I were looking through some of our policies and we didn't have any policies on leafletting and, and approved protesting at an airport and we thought now would be a good time. Well, we thought this back in January, but it's just starting to come through now because of COVID-19. Um, Sorry, now would be a time to get that before you. So Sean's gonna do just a small presentation. We're gonna learn how to share our screen here with you. Um, we'll, we'll be looking for a recommendation to take this policy change to city council as well. Apologize, we're still trying to figure out the technology here. So, um, the leafletting and uh, pres or, uh, demonstration policy that uh, we've been working on, uh, we looked at other airports around uh, this area in particular. Uh, we got a lot of assistance from the Austin Bergstrom International Airport and their operations staff there. So a lot of the policy that was uh, sent out earlier uh, is based upon their policy. Uh, but we did look also at like Lubbock and uh, we talked about El Paso a little bit too. Uh, very important for El Paso in particular, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but just to kind of start uh, the leafletting and demonstration policy, uh, because we don't have a policy in place at the moment, we don't have a way to protect the airport, uh, to protect its operations at the airport. Uh, and we also don't have a way to ensure that people are able to exercise their First Amendment rights. Uh, the airport itself is not recognized as a uh, public forum. Uh, so because of that, we have the opportunity to limit uh, what we can uh, have uh, occur here at the airport as expressive activity and what we can. Um, we do have a crowd control plan inside of our airport emergency plan, uh, but all that crowd control plan tells us is to call the police. Uh, the police don't have a way right now other than to you know, say, hey, you guys have to get out of here, but they have no other actual enforcement policy that they can do at the moment. So uh, this is important, obviously, for the airlines and the aircraft operations. Uh, we don't want people to be blocked from entering and exiting the, the airport terminal. Uh, that would really cause a lot of issues, and we'll go over uh, a similar situation with that here soon. Uh, it's also talking about safety uh, concerns for people to be able to access the airport, both uh, enter and leave the airport. Uh, with our other businesses, uh, even the ones on the flight lines, if we have the railways blocked here uh, in a manner that's not going to be conducive to business activity, that can cause a lot of issues, uh, obviously for them, uh, and a lot of safety issues, especially if we have to get emergency services here. So we're also uh, looking at protecting our damage, uh, our potential damage that could be caused to the uh, airport from any kind of protest or any kind of environmental environmental liabilities. And uh, the only thing right now that the city has, as far as a demonstration policy goes, is just a special event policy that limits gatherings of more than 50 people without having a permit issued by the city. That's not going to be good enough if you have 49 people blocking the entrance road. So that's one thing we were looking at too. So just a couple of recent examples of uh, airport protests that have been happening. This is probably one of the more, I guess, destructive ones that's happened in the last year. Uh, this happened at the Hong Kong International Airport over in Hong Kong, China. It was uh, because of some pro-democracy rights about extradition policies that uh, the Chinese government's imposing on the city of Hong Kong. 
uh, happened last year between August 12th and 14th. It canceled over 2,500 flights, and that was commercial and cargo. Uh, to say that it was inside the tens of millions of dollars is probably an understatement. It was probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, how much uh, revenue was lost uh, between those companies and uh, how many people had to cancel their flights. And it just, uh, it was not good for the airport there. They literally shut the airport down for three days. So more recent example here at home would have been something like the El Paso airport. So over the Christmas uh, holiday season last year, uh, a group came in to protest the airport uh, over its, uh, the airport's, I guess, ability to deport people uh, for, with uh, ICE, uh, the Immigration Customs uh, Service. So this was, uh, they had an airport policy in place. They were allowed to uh, have people inside the airport protesting and they did so in a peaceful manner that did not affect the operations. So it gave people their ability to ex exercise their first amendment rights but still allowed the airport to operate as an airport. So we have to ask ourselves, why would anyone want to protest us? We're perfect in every way. Uh, we are a little controversial though, if you look at some things. Uh, we do have the Customs and Border Patrol uh, Air and Marine uh, drone operations here. Uh, ICE does use the airport as a transfer location. We're not a deportation location, but when somebody is having to go to a court date, they will fly out of this airport. Uh, SJT, uh, the airport is also part of the city of San Angelo government. And you just have the, the general people who sometimes come in and do their own protest. Airline unions are very common, environmental groups, immigration groups. Uh, they're very common to protest at airports. So what's inside of this proposed policy? Well, it requires a permit uh, to be issued by the airport uh, to conduct expressive activity. Uh, that permit limits the amount of time, the duration of time that people can uh, be protesting or demonstrating or leafletting on the airport property. And it limits it uh, for how many people they can do too, to a safe amount, something that's not gonna impact our operations at the airport. It's still a lot of people to get their, uh, their uh, expressions out. Uh, it also allows us to locate the demonstrators and leaflet distributors uh, away from the essential airport operations areas to help kind of protect those for security purposes. And it also provides the airport liability indemnity uh, for any kind of uh, damages and uh, gives us a means to re uh, recoup those costs. And uh, I think that's it for that presentation, short and sweet. Uh, any questions? Yeah, on, on the outside demonstrations, any particular locations are restricted? Uh, I think that's gonna be determined on a as needed basis. Uh, depending on what the expressive activity is, we have to be conscientious of people's First Amendment rights, but at the same time, we don't want to make that uh, something that could potentially affect the airport operations. So okay. it's really going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Is that in your policy as needed? Uh, I believe, yeah, it was just, it's up to the uh, airport director uh, to make that determination. Thank you. Right. Any other questions on the uh, airport uh, leaf letting and demonstration policies? All right. We'll go on to future agenda items. Anybody have any future items they want to bring up? Hang on, Pat. Um, back to the leaf letting policy. Dr. Rallo is not able to be on, but he just wanted to include in the minutes that we need to put something in there defining the parameters of the airport. So we need to include parking lots or whatever we determine to be the airport, we need to define what that is in the policy. So we just want to get that in the minutes. Okay. And then we're looking for a recommendation to take this policy to city council. I'll make some motion. Thank you. I believe we take it to city council. You have a second. Okay. Um, Jeremy, you said you needed a clarification from us on the parameters of the boundaries for this policy. Is that right? Um, that's something that Dr. Rolla would like in the policy. We didn't define that in the policy. So he wants okay. us to make, he would like to see that thing changed. Okay. So do you have a suggestion for us? Just the boundaries of the airport property? Um, yeah, I think we'll run that by legal, but if that, uh, that would be my suggestion is airport property. Okay. Is Dan still on our meeting? I see he's on. Dan, can you hear us? Oh. 
Oh, yeah, I had to unmute. Yes, I've been listening. Um, yeah, all of that, all of that is uh, good. I think it should encompass all of the airport property. And, um, you know, there's that vacant ground in front of the airport. And I, I think that would be covered that way as well, even though it, it's not, um, it's not related to the, um, what do you call it, the air transportation itself <clears throat> right now, but I think you should cover all of the property because you've got the drive. You've got to drive up to the terminal building and all of that stuff. Well, yeah. I mean, we consider the airport property to include from Knickerbocker in, including the old water uh, treatment plant, right? That's right. Right. Okay. So yeah, I, the the traditional boundaries of the airport. Uh, I don't know if it was all part of Memphis Field originally. I don't recall offhand, but yeah, the entire tract of land that the city considers airport property on that side of Knickerbocker, I think should be included in this plan so that Jeremy can deal with requests under this policy. Right. I think what we will do is uh, try to utilize a plat type exhibit right. that'll be prepared by GIS. I'm sorry, prepared by who? Oh, our, um, our uh, GIS division, it does a mapping for us. Okay. Yeah, I think Jeremy, since they came up with this plan, will designate the boundaries that encompass as much as needed. Uh, I have my confidence in Jeremy <laughs> and his assistant director. Yeah, I think the main the main thing is to keep it people from blocking entrance to the terminal building, keep passengers from going in. That that's the main point. But they want to demonstrate in the grass area there on the side of the road. You know that that shouldn't be a problem. But uh, you know to get there may be a problem. You know one thing. But anyway, but I think Jeremy will have a a good plan for us when they come up with it. It would just block the bridge. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions? Uh, do we need to, we need to, uh, do we already pass this yet? Uh, we need a, a motion to accept this uh, airport leasing and demonstration policy. I make a motion to uh, accept this with provision that uh, the boundaries of the airport are delineated. And I'll second that. All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Aye's been passed. Um, future agenda items. Anybody have any future items they want to discuss? All right, if we don't have any more future items, I uh, make a motion to adjourn the meeting and thank everybody for coming and participating today. I think it went really well. And uh, I like this new kind of uh, forum here. I think it's great. Um, Pat, if I may, real quick, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending today. I know it's it was difficult. We, we ran into some challenges um, by getting everything posted. So thank you all for your time. Um, I would also, and I was remiss last time we met in person, and I'm, I'm sad I did this, but we do have a new board member and we didn't give him the opportunity to introduce himself. So, uh, Mr. Barrio or Barrio, tell me the correct way to say it. Do you Barrio. want to take a few minutes and, and introducing yourself today? Well, uh, my name is John Barrio and uh, got a long association with uh, Mathis Field. Back in 1979, I migrated here, getting, having just gotten out of the Air Force and worked for Mitsubishi Aircraft for seven years out there before they closed the doors. Uh, so to, to be on the board and to still be influential in what's going on with regard to aviation uh, is on my heart. And I appreciate everyone's participation. Uh, just thanks for welcoming, wel welcoming me aboard. Pardon me, it got tongue tied there. And uh, uh, I'll end that with ho, ho, ho. I'm glad you're here. Yep. All right, Jeremy, anything else? 
Uh, yeah, let me just give you a really quick update because last time we met, you had approved quite a few things to take to city council. One of them was, was a high priority item, which was an update on our fees. Um, everything that you recommended is going to be postponed um, probably until next year unless city council will approve it otherwise, which was um, parking outside the, the uh, vehicle parking outside the terminal. You also approved an increase in the rental car lease. That increase can still happen because that will be part of the lease negotiation um, and that will not have to wait for the, for the general fee review. We can just put that in our review with city council. Um, we had also talked about in, starting to charge for uh, rental car parking out in the parking lot. That's another fee that we can put in the lease. So really the only thing that's gonna be affected is the vehicle parking. That's not gonna happen as soon as we would like, which is okay because we were trying to get some infrastructure in place with the arms covered parking. We're trying to make it a nice facility before we really start charging. Uh, but just so you're aware that that has been tabled. We still have your recommendation on that. Karen, could I ask a question real quick? Has the council delayed that, put that off because of the difficulty in having public hearings to give public an input on new charges and fees? Or do you have a reason why they're delaying on that? I hope Dan can answer this one better than me, but I think initially it was just because the financial impact of the economy. Um, because of COVID-19, they didn't want to increase fees. In fact, the airlines put together a huge campaign requesting the airports do not raise fees over the next two to three Jeremy, years so they can recover. I think the council's uh, attitude is no, and Teresa, is no new fees on citizens during COVID. They're trying to, they're trying to keep the fees down as much as they can over the, during the COVID crisis. Okay, and just one other comment or observation I would make. I believe someone, possibly Molly, said that we had never charged uh, for parking at the airport. We did charge for parking at the airport back at least in the 80s when John Schwab was director, when I was working in the legal department. Uh, that's why the entrance to that short-term lot is the way it is, and you can still see, I think, uh, the remnants in the concrete where you used to take your ticket out of a little machine. Thank you. That's interesting. But it, I mean, it was a long time ago. Yeah. You know, I don't remember that, Teresa, but now that you mentioned that, I do remember a little machine out there. Yeah. yeah. So you're probably right. I, I yeah. don't remember it, but you're probably right. It does explain the entrance to that short term lot. Uh -huh. that there's yeah. something like that. So thank you. That's good information. Well, I'm sorry I wasn't present for the last meeting to add that two cents in, but yes, we, we did used to, I think it was 50 cents an hour. I think you're right. I think <laughs> you're right now that I think about it. With a maximum of maybe $2 a day. Yeah. Very low. I had forgotten that. Okay, Jeremy, sorry to interrupt your updates. No, that's okay. No, that's not an interruption. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is Dr. Rallo asked for an update on the ASU flight program for this meeting. Um, I still don't have a lot of information. We met with Dr. Tiger, who is the, uh, he's in charge of the business school at ASU and the flight program is now put on his lap. And he came to the office and said, I don't know anything about airplanes, um, but I'm here. So what, what can we do? And um, basically what he said is, they do want to run the program. What they're waiting for is someone to chair the program. So they're starting a search right now to, to get that chair. And they're, they're not going to make any more comments other than that until they get the chair. Um, I was hoping Dr. Rala would be on now. Um, if anybody else has any more information about the ASU program, it would be beneficial for this committee. Um, please speak up. But from what I heard, we're just we're on hold until they get a chair involved. But they do plan on running a, a pretty significant flight school out of our airport within right. the next two years. Jeremy, I think that was our next agenda, agenda, agenda on their agenda when Brian left. So I'm sure it's kind of, on, I think they do still plan to still do it, still plan to do it. But I think it's been slowed down a little bit. Thank you. Um, and then the last thing, just a very quick update on the COVID-19 response at the airport, just to let you guys know how we're doing and what we're doing. We did see a big de decrease nationwide, has seen a decrease um, San Angelo was down about 50%, um, which is great because the national average, they were down around 90%. Uh, 
we did hit a low of 90 percent at one point but we were we have increased a whole lot faster than the national average and a lot of that has to do with the base the families are flying in um, to see the students that are going through the base so we we're our traffic is picking up in fact they've added the third flight they're talking about adding a fourth flight this month because our load factors are, are picking back up they're extremely high um, i think a lot of this has contributed to what we've done around the airport um, the faa put out a a program recommended by CDC on how we can help reduce the impacts of COVID-19 in the, in the terminal building itself. That includes more cleaning or the frequency of cleaning and disinfecting, um, putting up the, the sneeze guards, the plexiglass guards, putting the dots out. I mean, very basic stuff that you're seeing at all the stores. Uh, we rolled that out really fast as the airport. We wanted to get proactive. That was Sean's full time job for the last four months. Um, so we were very active on that. And then when the FAA rolled out the recommendations, we were, we were already set. Um, so we're, we're doing the best we can. This airport's cleaner than it's ever been, and it will continue to be clean. And we want to send the message out that, um, yes, COVID is out there. It can run through our terminal, but we hope to get it as fast as we can and continue to keep the, the flying public safe and happy. So that's just a quick update on COVID-19. If you have any questions, Sean's back in the room and be happy to answer. What about compliance with mask wearing? Is that pretty good? You have a lot of voluntary compliance? Yeah, fortunately, yes. Everybody that's coming in, and now that the airlines require you to wear a mask to get on board the aircraft, everybody coming through the door is wearing a mask. And even the individuals going to the restaurants, they'll walk up to the door without a mask, they'll throw it on when they get in the building and take it back off when they go eat. So fortunately, we haven't had any issues with, good. with masks. Good. And Jeremy, before we go, I want to say one more thing. Um, um, we're going to miss Colonel Powell. He, he was very instrumental to our, our board for many years. And uh, I'm just sad to see that he passed away. And um, my understanding, I didn't get a chance to go to the service, but my understanding of the service was really nice. And uh, where he's going to be missed. Pat, I second what you say, and I appreciate you saying that. Colonel Powell was on the board for a long time, and he dearly loved not just this city, but especially that airport. All right. If anybody has any more questions, or Jeremy, you ready to adjourn the meeting? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. All right. I uh, motion that this meeting is adjourned. Bye. <laughs> Second. Thanks. Hi. Thank you, Teresa. Molly. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Jeremy.